Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pitman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full-time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates and the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston have the lead against Rangers and they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name is Angus and today I'm joined by Ewan. Ewan, how are you doing, man? Uh, I mean, we're recording this on Tuesday. We decided to, to hold off until the, the post-split fixtures were announced, but sadly it's not the post-split fixtures we were we were hoping for, Angus. Um, I, I remember doing an interview with Stevie Lawless when we first started the podcast and I remember him talking about Partick Thistle getting into the top six and he said it's not something you're going to tell the grandkids when you're older eh, that you made the top six once. So I never ever thought I'd be that gutted on missing out on the top six but uh, I, I was absolutely deflated on, on Saturday, absolutely deflated. Eh, not even the Masters could, could cheer me up watching Masters weekend. So yeah, Absolutely gutty, but I suppose we'll have to talk about it, won't we? What about yourself? How are you feeling? Very much the same, man. Very much the same. But you know, we'll we'll get all we'll get right into that very shortly. But as always, you can find this episode as well as all of our others on your preferred podcast streaming sites. Just search for Top Livy to follow us and subscribe to ensure you don't miss out on another episode. We'll start the episode off by discussing that heartbreaking late draw against Motherwell as the Lions missed out on our top six finish. Next up, it's award season in the football calendar, and we'll discuss who we think is in contention to pick up the awards at Livy. And finally, I caught up with Glenn Struder from Red Tinted Glasses to discuss our upcoming trip to Pataudry to take on Aberdeen. It was a top six shootout at the Tony Macaroni Arena on Saturday as a win was vital for the Lions to secure top six. Despite leading 2-0, Laura Well would snatch a point at the death to break Lovey's hearts. Ewan, we've already kind of discussed it, but, you know, just how, how were we feeling after that? Uh, just deflated uh, is, is the best way I can I can put it. I guess I, I think if you saw the players' reactions at, at full time, I think you could tell how much it meant to them to try and finish in the top six for a, a third consecutive season. And they were obviously absolutely gutted in, in the manner that it's happened. But to actually talk about the game itself, I genuinely think we played really well for, for 70 minutes of the game. And it's just, it's another late goal. Let's, let's cost us points. And it's it's been a recurring theme kind of stages throughout the season. But to... To kind of talk about the game itself, I think we had, I think first half, we absolutely bossed Motherwell. The fact that we only went in 1-0 up at half time, I think, <laughs> flattered Motherwell. I Obelize had a header which has gone over the bar. He's then had an effort which he's, he's rammed into the side netting and then we did manage to get the lead uh, around about 25 minutes. Good little bit of play from between Pitts and Alan Forrest. Forrest has slipped the ball through. Jake Carroll's kind of been wrong-footed almost by the ball through and, and Odin's tucked it away really well. I think Odin's actually caught Liam Kelly off guard because I thought he was going to go and try and round him, uh, but he's taken it really early and just slipped it underneath him to, to put us 1-0 up. And it's from the first half performance, it's exactly what we deserve from, from it. And, you know, second half, 
Obviously, we had to make a change first half with Penners coming off with a with a head knock, and Adam Lewis went to left back. And I think Motherwell's tactic second half was just to shell balls at Adam Lewis for the entirety of the half, try to take advantage of the fact he's more slightly more diminutive and uh, they might be able to get on top of him physically. But you know, I think Adam held up to the task quite well. But there was a couple of chances that came down his side in the first real opportunity Motherwell had in the game was Van Veen's one where he's hit the post and it's it's been clawed away on the line by by Max but we've then gone almost straight up the park and, and got the second goal it's good initial play by Alan Forrest he's fed out to Bailey it's the ball's then eventually broke to, to Nicky Devlin who's cushioned it into Alan Forrest and again he's tucked it away really well I felt like it went in in slow motion Alan Forrest's goal but you're thinking at that point you know Hibs are getting beat at at time, Castle, Ross County were at the time drawing as well. You're thinking, oh, it's the perfect day. Everything's going in our favour. Alan Forrest had another chance, which he, which he put wide of the post. And then, for me, we're denied an absolute stonewall penalty yet again this week. Uh, when Nicky Devlin's put in behind, he's clearly clipped. When Nicky's travelling at pace like that, a touch like that is going to put you off balance. For me, that is a penalty to go 3-0 up. And we're not even talking about a mother will come back, in my opinion. And it's another poor, poor decision that's gone against us. However, I'm not going to blame our entire season on refereeing decisions, but they managed to pull the goal back. Slattery's hit an absolute raker from 25 yards out of absolutely nothing. Mother will have found themselves in the game. And the equaliser, it's it's a catalogue of errors, even before the set piece, I think both. I Obelai and, and Adam Lewis have opportunities to clear the ball. We've sliced it out for a corner. Kind of spoke about it off, off recording with Brinny last week that your know, set plays is going to be a big thing against Motherwell given the big physical side. And there's three phases in the set play that we don't defend well enough. And then the ball's falling perfectly for Ricky Lamy, even though there's three bodies all around Ricky Lamy when it's came back off the off the crossbar. And of course it had to be Ricky Lamy who Andy Semple described as a bottom half premiership player when he left the club. So that that's come back to haunt us on top. Love you. Cheers for that, Andrew Semple. Thank you for that. But absolutely, absolutely devastated, you know, looking at the players at full time. Nicky Devlin in particular looked absolutely distraught. But we'll go and talk about it in a bit more depth. But I do think we could have had top six wrapped up weeks ago and it shouldn't have come down to this final game personally. But it's... It's frustrating because I think for 70 minutes of the game, I think we played very, very well. And we did not deserve to lose that game of football, in my opinion. Uh, well, I, we didn't actually lose the game of football, but Christ, it feels <laughs> like we have. I think that's what the, the strange part of it is, is, you know, the performance was so good. I put it up there as, you know, in terms of home performance, he's one of the best of the season, you know, at least for 75 80 minutes at least. Yeah, because that entire first half, I don't think Morwell did absolutely anything. Like, I think Van Veen had an effort from far out, but the pressure was all put on by us and, you know, we're very much in the ascendancy. They started to creep in a wee bit in the second half and then we got that second goal and then obviously created another couple of chances as well. So I thought, like, you know, everything in that game of regard, the efforts can't be faulted whatsoever. But then again, we're talking about these kind of fine margins we've allowed them to have essentially two shots on target and we've conceded two goals um, and it's cost us dearly in the end to finish in the bottom six. I mean, you're absolutely spot on about, you know, this could have been handled a long time ago. Um, you know, you look at so many points throughout the season where the extra points, you know, that would have done us to already be in that position. Um, you know, you look at, you know, late goals conceded against like Ross County, I mean, even some of the home form this season, you know, we've not picked up nearly enough as we probably would have liked to against some of the, the teams lower in the table. And I think, you know, there will be a lot of disappointment from from a lot of the players, you know, that they haven't been able to get it, you know, over the line. Um, but I guess that will give them, you know, the kind of the enthusiasm, to, you know, to make sure that the season ends strong because, you know, we go from, you know, maybe being in the top six to, you know, now keeping, having an, an eye over our shoulder again. I mean, I think it's um, there is only five games to go. We're eight points ahead of uh, St Johnston. Is it quite likely that there's an eight point swing going to happen in there? 
who knows, possibly so. You never know what happens in this. You know, St Johnston will be fancying their chances against everybody else in this league. And we've got to do the business on the park. I mean, we've probably got two of the toughest games um, coming up first, you know, away to Aberdeen, you know, then at home at Hibs. I know they've not been on great form, but they're classically kind of two of the bigger sides who, you know, can pull out a result. Yeah, we've got to not rest on our laurels a wee bit and not be sitting licking our wounds, but we've got to, you know, make sure that our, our league status for next year is secured. And based on that performance, I'm more confident that, you know, in this run of five games that, we you know, we're going to pick up enough points to do it. But let's just hope that, you know, the morale isn't too low from, you know, just being within touching distance and falling just short at the very, at the very final hurdle. But yeah, very, 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 very depressing day. Can't be, can't be denied. Now, the starting lineup probably raised a, a couple of eyebrows in the in the starting eleven. Sean Kelly came in for for Stefan Omionga, and then it turned out that that Joel Nubley played as the number nine. However, I think you need to compliment Davy because arguably our two best players on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. To start off with Nubley, you know we've always heard like since he's came back, everybody's been saying, "Oh yeah, he must be playing as a winger. He's much better there." And for the most part of his performances, he has been more effective on the wing. But, you know, him, up, him going up against, you know, the very physical back line of Motherwell, he was absolutely superb, you know, getting in the way, holding on to the ball. Um, he was absolutely brilliant. And I think that was probably his best game in Olivier's shirt, you know, how much he kept the ball and, you know, getting down the line, being an absolute nuisance. Um, I think you would have seen, I did say uh, to my pal Blair before the game, I was like, maybe it's a wee bit harsh on Soto not getting another run in the team, but, Again, you can't complain with, you know, the way that not only Nubly played, but also the way that, you know, Forrest and Bailey did as well. It'll be interesting to see how we go on in the next couple of weeks. You know, Anderson's probably expected back in, you know, two or three weeks, apparently. Will Nubly continue to be there in that role? Maybe against Aberdeen, they'll be looking to do something similar, you know, up against like say, Declan Gallagher and Bates and that. But yeah, absolutely tremendous. And then, yeah, Sean Kelly as well. Definitely everybody would have been like, oof, wow, massive game. Uh, you would have been on Twitter, you would have seen you know, all the people kind of being about how it's such a massive game and, you know, Sean Kelly's been chucked into the middle of the park. But I think the thing that most uh, impressed me with Sean Kelly was, you know, see his just sheer willingness to get on the ball. How many times, you know, he just kept dropped into that wee hole and just got into it. I mean, we're so used to seeing Jason Holt doing it. Jason Holt was kind of doing a wee bit of a decoy, in all honesty. He was kind of drifting out right to, you know, to, create up, uh, to free up the space for Sean Kelly to come in. And, yeah, Kelly was magnificent kept the ball, you know, he did just did all, you know, the kind of simple stuff, you know, uh, what you'd want from a defensive midfielder, just kept the ball, retained it, you know, made the tackles when you need to, um, dropped into the defence whenever it needed covering and whatnot. And yeah, he was very, very impressive. And I think he deserves a, a lot of credit for, for slotting in so uh, so easily, especially taking the space off of Omi Onga, who, you know, has been, uh, you know, a fan favourite over the last couple of months. Yeah, but we were sitting in the in the stadium bar when the when the team lines came out, and my dad wasn't particularly pleased when he saw Sean Kelly playing. And that's I'd like to go on record. Cal Moore can back me up, but we both said it at the time. It'll be because of how physical Motherwell are that he's probably put Sean Kelly in there for a bit of height in the middle of the park as well. Mm-hmm. But I think Sean was excellent, absolutely excellent. And as you say, it was. I was really encouraged by the way he was shown for the ball all the time. And to be honest, rarely gave the ball away as well. He was very good in possession as well. And, you know, he took a, we were complaining about a Murray Davidson tackle last week, but Sean Kelly did one, you know, not maybe quite as uh, malicious, but a clear shot pull in the middle of the park in terms of just taking one for the team as well. And I think Sean was, was excellent and uh, can be very happy with his performance. Obviously, I think, He's had a lack of game time this season, so maybe after kind of 75 minutes, he was starting to tire and had less of an effect on the game. But I have to say, was pleasantly surprised with with his performance in the middle of the park. To touch on Joel again, we spoke about it. Would he put Joel through the middle? Because, uh, again, the physical nature that he's got, his presence, his size to occupy the Motherwell centre halves, and it it worked a treat. And it reminded me a lot of the, the game at Easter Road, where Forrest and, and Bailey played either side of him. And that front three worked magnificently at Easter Road that day. And it it worked again. Odin was excellent, got a goal. Alan got a goal. 
and Joel occupied the centre half excellently. I think Davy obviously made a, a tactical tweak during the game to go to a back three. Again, I'm, I can't complain about it too much because, as I mentioned, Motherwell were obviously trying to target Adam Lewis for his height. So he decided to go to a back three, put Morgan Boys out on the left hand side of the three to offer a bit more height out that side. Again, I can't, I can't really fault the, the tactical change Davy's made. I know a lot of folk were, were complaining about it, but personally, it's a change I would have probably made as well. So I can't, I, I can't really fault it. It's just, it's just an absolute sucker punch of a way to, to let it go, but. I look back at games throughout the season and I, I put together probably nine points that we've dropped in the last 10 minutes of games this season. Aberdeen, right at the start with the, the match strijek fumble. You had Ross County away, St Mirren at home, St Johnston at home. The two Motherwell games at home we've conceded late on uh, to drop points. So there's, for me, even if you... I know you're not going to get all of them. I know you're going to concede late goals throughout the season. It's just that it's, you know, it's bound to happen. But I feel even if you pick up half those points, you're potentially sitting fourth. And I just, I feel like this season might become one that's like, you look back at it and it's a, what it could have been. And that I think that's the frustration. But to put it very clearly, the fact that we are talking about being so disappointed about not reaching the top six, I think, tells you how far this football club has come. At the end of the day, see if we still finish 10th this season. It's still a successful campaign on paper. Would any Livy fan have taken that at the start of the season? If you're realistic, yeah, I would off. And granted, I'm absolutely gutted we've not made the top six, but we've still got a bit to play for. As you say, you're kind of glancing over your shoulder at St Johnston. You've arguably got the two most difficult games to start off the split going into the, what could then be a St Johnston game if they pick up a couple of positive results in the meantime. So there's still, I think, if we win one game, that's it, over and done with. And we're, we're absolutely safe because I can't see with four games to go, even if St Johnston beat Dundee eight, eight points in four games, no chance. So... There's still a lot to play for, but it, it, it does have that that tinge of what could have been. And I know a few folk on the Facebook forum were wanting to blame all the refereeing decisions, but at the end of the day, you're not in control of a refereeing decision. Points that we can take control of is how we've seen a few games out this season. And I think you know the Motherwell game just kind of epitomised that, unfortunately. Yeah, there's not really much more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just depressing, isn't it? Try to think of a cheerier way to, you know, kind of end this segment, but <laughs> they're just dissonance there. But yeah, on to the next one, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think you just you do need to take a bit of perspective in this situation. As I say, when you're a you're a fan of a club like ourselves, who are a banker to get relegated every season of this league, and you've managed to probably looks like avoid relegation again, and you're sitting gutted that you've not made the top six. I, th- I think just speaks volumes of what the club is doing on and off the field to compete in this league. And for me, it's, I always go back to that, and I, I know there'll be listeners that think I'm being really negative when I say it, but 10th and above every year in this league is success for this football club. Until we have 4,000 season ticket holders, which is not realistic, right? But to compete with the other teams in this league, to have that sort of backing and finance coming in, Tenth and above a success, and unfortunately, it wasn't to be for us this season. But let's let's bear in mind, we've only had three top six finishes in our history. <laughs> you know, it's it's not like it was a regular thing ever. So, <laughs> I think as gutting as it is, as gutting as it is, I think there's still a fair bit to play for as the season goes on, and hopefully. We can we can pick up a positive result in our next game to to go on to the split fixtures though I guess. How are you feeling going into these games? It's a weird one because again, just because of like you know how the league's been this season as a whole, everybody can probably beat everybody. Maybe bar Dundee, I would maybe say just because of you know how poor they have been you know for you know very very long time now and like they've had absolutely zero manager bounce with uh, Mark McGee 
<laughs> I still laugh at Mark McGee. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> like, so usually you go into games so against Hibs and Aberdeen. To be fair, we always go into game, games against Hibs and I always feel, you know, slightly confident. But if we do get beat off of Hibs, it's not like a shock result or anything like that. It is kind of can be expected. Aberdeen or luck at Pataudry has not been great at all. So look at, looking at those games and I'm like, you know what, we can actually do something here because, you know, how poor their recent forms have um, been. I mean, I've watched Hibs a couple of name, a couple of times now for, like, for like the uni and stuff. And, you know, they keep a lot of the ball, but they don't really do anything with it. And I think that, you know, we always kind of talk about us, you know, being that kind of team against them who can, you know, bully them off the park. And I still feel, I feel that's even more the case now with Maloney. The Aberdeen one's a very interesting one because, you know, our record against them sometimes is not very good. But again, you're talking about another team who'll be completely short of confidence, who's low on form. And then St Johnston and St Mirren, two teams again who, you know, kind of just solid sides, but they've kind of got the better of us this season so far. So they're all winnable games, but they're not without their own dangers as well. We've just got to, you know, make sure that we do our own finish games off this time essentially and um, don't make the same mistakes that we've that have cost us the top six and you know hopefully you know we can have like a, a comfortable end to the season rather than you know getting to the wire and being like oh will we won't we yeah just as soon as possible as we can get it to uh, our status in the premiership secured just as long as we can get that done as soon as possible that's fine for me yeah I mean you're looking you mentioned that yourself Aberdeen of obviously I'll speak to to Glenn later on about it, but one one and seven since Goodwin's come in, not the best of form. They are falling into the into the bottom six on a on a downer. Hibs as well, kind of falling in on a bit of a downer. St Mirren, I think St Mirren are the team in free fall since Robinson's come in. I've I've heard some St Mirren fans comparing them to Alan Stubbs already, which is a lie. Yeah. You know, he's only won one game since coming in the door. St Johnston are probably your team that you're looking at that are the only one but the thing is they've just lost the game 7-0 okay, to see. Park. <laughs> and you're talking about them probably coming in with the most confidence coming in there you know and then but the first game and the, the split fixtures you know Dundee play St Johnston as well that could take Dundee completely out of the equation if St Johnston were to go to Dens and win so there's a lot of connotations. Ideally, you're probably looking at that game and going, you want Dundee to win because then it pegs St Johnston back as well. And you can potentially open up that gap as well. But look, as I say, there's still a lot to play for going into these last few games for the football club. So hopefully we can bounce back and, and get a few positive results and get a bit of momentum going for, for next season as well. It's award season and here on Top Levy we'll discuss who we think are in line for the awards at our football club after this campaign. Angus, we'll, we'll start off with the biggie. It's, uh, it's Player of the Year. Who would be your vote for Player of the Year this season? At the halfway point of the season, I wrote a, a wee article that was kind of talking about the key players for Livingston, you know, in that kind of first half of the season. I outlined Max Strayek, Jack Fitzwater and Jason Holt um, as the three players I thought were, you know, the most strong uh, contenders for this uh, this award. But to no, sh- no shock you in, I've got a new front runner for myself. And I don't think you'll be able to waste any guesses at all as to who who it is. And I think deservedly so. It can only be talked about Alan Forrest. And I think it's justified, you know, from... From that, just uh, the spell from you know December onwards, you know, essentially from where it was said that you know he might be leaving, I don't think we've had anybody who's been you know nearly as much of a threat or as kind of consistent. Um, I think the run of form that Forrest has been on this kind of second half of the season has been absolutely tremendous, you know, and he's starting to get you know the more goals and assists, you know, to to back up the performances as well. There's been a lot of games where you know Forrest has really not deserved to be on the losing side in that. I think that game against St Johnson in particular is one where you're like how on earth are have we been in the losing end here with a player playing that well? But yeah, it'd be very, very sad to see him go at the end of the season if he chooses to. But I think, you know, the last five months or so, it can't be denied that, you know, he has been, you know, our star player. And that's why, you know, we're seeing now the links of like Hearts and that coming in for him and that. Yeah, 
he's been absolutely tremendous and hopefully it continues in these last five games of the season as well. I do think I'm maybe being a wee bit harsh on Jason Holt. I think that, um, if I had to pick a second place, I would go for him. Um, I think over the kind of the course of the whole season, he's probably been the most solid. You know, gives everything that you don't ever want from you know that kind of combative, you know, ball retaining a centre midfielder. But yeah, I think I'm going to have to stick stick to my guns, stick to what I know, and I'm going to back Alan Forrest for it. Jeez, mate, he's not going to shag you. Never know. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> nah, I mean, if I'm going to be consistent with what I normally do every year, I always look at the, the season as a whole. And even when we had that that slump in form at the start of the campaign, the the player. You've already mentioned them there. That has been steady, steady consistency, and I genuinely think it's had a fantastic season as Jason Holt. I think we're incredibly lucky to have a player like Jason Holt at the football club. And I was watching a view from the terrace before we started recording, and uh, Joe Sked was was talking about bigging up Holtie, and one of the comments that got made was, "Oh, he's got no goals and no assists this season," but I think. If you're just watching highlights, you maybe don't see what Jason Holt does for your team. Joe Sked then came out with a couple of stats. I think he's second for interceptions in the league. He's very high up in kind of Joe's one and things like that as well. I think it's that side of the game that Holt he does brilliantly. And I think even in a, a poor start to the season and a little slumps in form, I still think Jason Holt's been a standout most weeks for us. Never less than really a seven or eight out of ten. And I think... If you take Holt out of our team, I think you lose a lot in the middle of the park for what he brings. Other players that I think have really stepped up this year, I think Jack Fitzwater has had a very, very good season. There was maybe a few question marks last year with him. Probably his first full season in, in senior football, obviously, had a very successful spell coming through West Brom's academy in the 23s and things like that. But coming up here for the first year, he had the odd display where you're going, right, you can see what he's all about. But I think this year he's been very consistent. He's he's not been in and out of the team this year like he was last year, with the likes of FA being there, Kieran Brown being there. So he kind of found himself in and out of the side a lot last season. But this year he's been, the, I would say, your, your main centre half. And I think he's had a very, very steady campaign. And there was a few big transfer rumours about him in, in January as well so I think I think Fitzy's in line for it as well and yeah it's hard it's hard to look past your top goal scorer as well isn't it and Brucey he'll obviously come up when we talk young player of the year as well but I think Bruce Anderson's especially second half of the season has been excellent up until his his injury was very very good I think it's been really good to see Brucey's progression since he came in I think we spoke about it a few weeks ago and I think you could always tell Bruce would score goals for us but I think his all round game has came on leaps and bounds and I think Bruce spoke about it recently that he's been coming in doing extra sessions working on his hold up plays his work outside the penalty box and I think Bruce would probably come into that category as well in terms of the impact he's had but it's probably a good way to, to tie into young player of the year so thinking the three that I could think of the top of my head that come under that 23s bracket Obviously, Bruce is one. Odin Bailey being another as well, uh, who's had a very, very good season. I think became a little bit of a, a fan's favourite when he's playing as well. Who's who's your pick of the bunch, though, for young player of the year? Well, we were just kind of discussing this, you know, before, like off camera, before we started the segment about, you know, how young player of the year kind of, there's like an asterisk next to it because it kind of goes from when the season started and it's kind of like from when they were 23 or under before the start of the season. Uh, so for that reason, I think I'm going to have to go with Jack Fitzwater because I highlighted him, you know, before as one of the kind of the player, main players of the season. Again, I feel like, like Jason Holt, he's one of the key performers for this entire year. Um, and you're absolutely spot on. You're, you're looking at last season, the kind of the transformation from there, where, you know, probably at times he was, you know, maybe fourth or fifth choice centre-back in some occasions to then come in, you know, we lost Keenan Brown, we lost... If the Ambrose and you know we lost John Guffrey, who you know was an absolute massive like fan favourite, and um, absolute great player for us. I, for me especially, my biggest concern at the start of the season, you know, was that centre back position because I was like, we've just lost literally, you know, most of our best players in that area. But if Swatters came in and he settled and he's 
handled it um, tremendously well. He even started to get a couple of goals as well. So, yeah, I think for over the whole course of the season, I think Fitzwater's definitely been up there. For And, yeah, I'd give him Young Player of the Year. don't know if 24 necessarily counts, but, you know, it's always that kind of thing that we always go on about way at least this time of the year. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, if he was to get it, I wouldn't have too many complaints. What about yourself? Obviously, Bruce Anderson is is a biggie. I've already spoke about Bruce. Odin Bailey, after his first kind of four or five games, that almost that settling in period, I think he's been, I think he's brilliant to watch Odin at times. Uh, I see he's just signed a, a new contract at Birmingham as well, which I, I believe his contract was up at the end of the season. There might have been the old Lovey fan that thought, oh, could we maybe entice him? But I think money-wise, we would have never been able to to keep a hold of Odin regardless. But I think he's been terrific to watch. And bear in mind, Odin was coming in to essentially replace Josh Mullen, who is a massive fan's favourite. Uh, so he was under pressure right from the get-go when he when he came in the door. And I think technical ability-wise, I think he's the best player at the football club, in my opinion. I think. And you can tell that the lad's got a bright future ahead of him as well. A couple of the goals he scored have been fantastic. I think of the one up at up at Ross County in particular was we were right behind that one and it was it was in as soon as he hit it. Another player who I think you know local lad rejoined in the summer's James Penn race. I think I'll be honest, I I may be questioning if Penners could make a step up having played kind of bottom end championship with Thistle week one to come in to play top flight football. And I think he had a couple of games at left back where he, he did struggle at times in the early part of the season. But you've got to say he's a first choice left back now, isn't he? Uh, I think folk would have had Jack in there at the start of the campaign, but I think Penners has made that position his own. And he's my biggest compliment I can pay Penners from back when he first joined us on loan was he was an 18 year old but played the game like a 28 year old. I think he plays the game almost beyond these years. And I think you can see that. And I think Penners, again, has got a very, very bright future at the football club. And I've been pleasantly surprised with how good he's been, in particular kind of just before the winter break, where he really started to kind of cement that left-back slot. So I think the young player one's a bit of a toss-up, to be honest. I think there's a few players that are, are certainly in contention for it. But I mentioned Odin Bailey's goal. Goal of the season, Angus. Now, I came up with a little short list. <laughs> and there's a couple that are maybe you wouldn't maybe say is the best goal you scored, but it's the moment in it. And uh, Andrew Shinney's against Celtic was one. The Tom Parks header up mm-hmm. at Ross County, purely for the scenes, the scenes alone. Odin Bailey's one in the same game was another one that came up. Alan Forrest, the winner at Easter Road, fantastic finish. Pitsy's goal against Dundee United. Was was another one I thought of the uh, on the spin on the on the half volley, and Nicky Devlin's equaliser at, at St Mirren as well late on uh, on the half volley. Nicky Devlin prancing up from the back to hammer that one in. Those were the six that I had as probably a goal of the season contenders. Is there is there any other ones that you think are in with a shout? Well, the first one that came to my mind is actually not on your list, and I think this is just purely based on the skill and technique involved in it. And it's Obelai against Aberdeen. Oh, God. I, I had that on my list and I forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> Just for the pure, the pure cheekiness, the pure, like, how many times you would try that? How many times, like, you'd be in that situation to think to do something like that and how expertly it was, you know, delivered, essentially. I don't think you'll ever see, many, like, how many goals do you see that like that eh, in the Scottish League? You know, Bruce Anderson fires a shot in and he just instinctively flicks it above, you know, the Aberdeen keeper. I don't know if it was Woods who was in at the time. I and then over Ramirez uh, on the line as well. Absolutely delightful, you know, from a centre half as well. I mean, I was already showing like how sil- silky he can be in that. For me, that that goal is, you know, expertly, like technique wise, that's absolutely tremendous. And for me, I would have to go for that, I think. I shit you not, I, I genuinely was sitting in bed last night and I was going <laughs> through the list and I went, oh, I, I was against Aberdeen. And then as soon as I've read it out and I've gone, crap, how did I forget that one? You're right. <laughs> that that was for sheer filth. Yeah. I always wins it. 
but I don't know there's a sentiment one with Tom Parks <laughs> Tom Parks header up it I think in, in the space of 10 days I was treated to Scott McTominay's winner at Hamden against Israel in the 93rd minute and then Parks scored in that one up at up at Dingwall in the 95th minute and it was like I don't this is me getting a bit soppy but after you've spent a year away from going to the football and it's like you get those moments and mm. it was like that oh, th- this is why you miss football it's why you traipse up and down the country following your team it's for moments like that might not be the best goal scorer but in terms of for the the, the sheer moment uh, Tom Parks would win it for me but if you're going technique wise I think I think you're right Ayo's is it's just utter filth, isn't it? It's just filthy. <laughs> it would it would get put on you porn. Like that's <laughs> it's, it's that filthy the technique. But we we also have the women's team. Unfortunately, their season's kind of petered out. I know they lost at the weekend to them through three two, another one where they've come from two goals down. But we'll talk about our women's player of the year. Angus, you've probably out of all of us have, have got to see the girls the most this season. Who's who's really stood out for you and amongst the women's team? I think there's a, a good couple of candidates you can have. A lot of goals being scored this season and that. So I think naturally you kind of gravitate towards, you know, a couple of strikers. I mean, you've got Ashley Fish who just can't stop scoring. You've got Jen Dodds as well. I'm going to stay away from the two forwards. Well, I think, you know, I think it's been clear in the last kind of couple of weeks that the absence of a certain player has, you know, kind of impacted the team's season. I think that's Rachel Walkinshaw. Rachel, obviously, I think has came from, you know, a higher level um, before playing at the likes of Hearts, I believe it is. And I think you can see whenever, you know, in certain games, you can notice when she's not there. Every game that she plays, she completely dictates the tempo and runs the show and everything like that. An absolutely phenomenal player to watch and is, yeah, an absolute pleasure to, you know, to be able to see, you know, playing for the club at the moment. Um, I think just everything from defensive-wise to, you know, to, attacking why she's never afraid to you know to to take risks in that and um, she always wants to you know play that killer pass wants to take shots from long and it's just a very encouraging player as well Ashley Fish and Jen Dodds are definitely very very unlucky to miss out and um, because you know the amount of goals that they've scored between the two of them is absolutely incredible they're always a threat uh, in the danger areas and that as well and um, a couple of uh, players at the back line as well I think Natasha Frew and Jess Murphy have had absolutely incredible seasons as well but I think just in a pure, on like a footballing level, I think, you know, the team really does suffer when Rachel Walkinshaw is not there. Not as like a discredit to anybody else who's, you know, taking her place or anything like that. But the ability that she has, I think, could have made a difference in this kind of run in here. Um, unfortunately, suffered a wee bit of an injury that's kind of um, hampered the team. But hopefully she'll be back soon and, you know, the, the team can get back to the good form that they were on. Yeah, I mean, Rachel. Rachel's a top player at that level, as you say, has, has played top flight football in Scotland and I, I think it shows in a lot of the games that she plays and hopefully she's, I believe it's a knee injury that Rachel's got, so hopefully she's she's back and able to maybe feature in the last couple of games of the season. You, you mentioned it already, it's very difficult to look past the two goal machines up top, isn't it? <laughs> and it's almost it's almost unfair to pick one of them over the other as well, isn't it? With, with yeah. the goals that they've scored. But I think a, a constant source for their goals is, is Sharon Hughes-Lee on, on, on the right-hand side, bombing up and down that right-hand side all day. And how many times has she hung a ball up at the back stick for Ashley Fish to pop up with a header at the, at the back post? It, it's like that game you turned up late for. It was. <laughs> I just said to you, it's a typical Ashley Fish goal, Sharon, you know, hung up at the back post. And you could just picture it without having been there. I think Sharon's had a very good season, but I, I'm, I'm going to totally sit on the fence and, <laughs> and I'll say that Ashley and Jen can share uh, the Women's Player of the Year award because I think they've both been terrific. And I think, as, as I say, I think they've just been fantastic in terms of the goals that they've scored. They've, it's, it's quite remarkable. You, you see them on the score sheet just about every week when they feature. But I mean, that's, that's our thoughts on it. Listeners, once you've had a wee listen, get in touch with us. Let us know your thoughts. Who's your player of the year, young player, goal of the season, women's player of the year. Let's hear your thoughts on, on Twitter and Facebook. A bit of interaction regarding that as well. It'd be great.
I'm delighted to welcome Glenn Schroeder from Red Tinted Glasses back onto the podcast. Glenn, how you doing? Yeah, you. thanks very much for letting me back on uh, Talk Livy. A pleasure to be back on, despite your best efforts at hijacking our player of the year, Paul Jet ma- only managed to come in fourth. Absolutely gutted he didn't get a medal place. Uh, that's, that's severely disappointing for the big man, but we tried our best. We tried our you, best. You did, but um, I'll also say before we get into it, just congratulations to you guys. I know you guys got is it 30,000 downloads, so fantastic effort for what you guys have been doing and um, producing some great content um, around Livingston. And yeah, just um, happy to help contribute to the podcast. No, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, it's a big achievement for for three wee daft days like us talking about Livingston FC. So we never thought we never thought 30 folk would listen, never mind 30,000 at some point. So, But since you were last on, since the eventful game at, at Livy, it's, uh, it's been fairly hectic at Aberdeen. First of all, Stephen Glass, not long after the game, I think it was the following week after the cup tie was sacked. What was your initial reaction to the news? I'm guessing it didn't come as a, a big surprise, did it? No, it didn't come as a huge surprise. It was inevitable. I think the the manner in which we lost that game to yourselves kind of set the tone. You know, I think I said to you at full time in that game when I messaged you saying, you know, we were probably lucky that the scoreline flattered us. Um, and I think you guys should have won that game by more. And obviously we've now, you know, brought in Jim Goodwin. Unfortunately, the results haven't improved. I, I know it's difficult to judge on only seven games that he's had. And we found ourselves now in the bottom six in unfamiliar territory for the first time in, in nine seasons. So, yeah, it, it's strange. And obviously we're, we're going to start seeing a, a player turnover coming this summer. You know, Jim Goodwin's taken the decision to announce players being, their contracts being terminated before the end of the season. Whether or not we're now seeing the result of that affecting performances with players maybe becoming demotivated or demoralised by some of these decision makings um, it's it's going to be a nervous game uh, I'm not I, I'm not looking forward to it I, I know I said to you I'm not actually going to be there yeah. enjoy getting a stag do but it, it's an interesting game because if Livingston I think if you guys come up here and come away with a point or even three there's going to be some serious pressure on, on Aberdeen to possibly avoid that that 10th place because yeah, there's a lot of people very nervous, I think it's fair to say, up here. Yeah, you, you mentioned Jim Goodwin came in. You you moved quite quickly to appoint Jim Goodwin from St Mirren. But as you said, it's it's not been playing sailing for him so far. One win in seven, albeit there's been a few draws in amongst that as well. What's the overall feeling regarding the appointment of Jim Goodwin? I think I'm going to name him Jim Goodraw because that's how well he's been going so far. But I, I don't know. He was, to be honest, he was my preferred candidate out between him and Jack Ross whether or not we did a thorough process it was definitely more thorough than the appointment of the chairman's best friend from Atlanta I have to say I do really enjoy your chat about Dave Cormack's teeth oh, I'm red, yeah. it? it cracks me up every time I oh, hear it <laughs> no don't worry there'll be a lot of talk on that coming up on red tinted glasses with the way the season's uh, the season's gone but I don't know it's it's a difficult one because I suppose he did a decent job with St Mirren given you know their budget in comparison to Aberdeen. He seems to be able to identify a good player. You look what he's done with Jamie McGrath, Connor Ronan this season as well. He's obviously inherited a squad that's not exactly performed to the best of its ability and that's kind of continued in his seven games in charge, as you said, you know, just the one win. And to be honest, that's come over a very struggling Hibernian side, so no real surprises there. It's it's going to take time for him to be able to implement his own stamp on the squad, but time's not exactly what Jim Goodwin's got in, in his favour with five games remaining this season. He said he would come in and be able to fix the defence. That was something that he would find easy. That's not being fixed. We're still leaking cheap goals. He said he you know his aim was to make sure we were in the top six. He's also not done that. So I'm not going to say that there's grumblings up here yet, but there's certainly going to be pressure on these five games coming up. As you mentioned as well, he's certainly shown a bit of a ruthless streak since since going to the North East. Uh, a number of high-profile departures, first one kind of being Scott Brown, was, was shown the door. He's obviously said Jet's not going to get a new... He's going to have his contract terminated, which is, which is devastating for the big man. Um, <laughs> 
Andy Considine, who I know is a, a huge, huge fan's favourite up at Aberdeen as well, being mentioned that he's leaving. What's what's the kind of feeling? Does that signal another rebuild? Because we spoke about this at the start of the season. It was a bit of a rebuild year for Aberdeen, transition year with Glass coming in, but it seems like that's going to be continuing this summer. Yeah, it almost feels like the appointment of Stephen Glass has set us back a few seasons. I mean, I would obviously wouldn't be saying this had we you know, the appointment worked out, but it, it hasn't. And we're now, I, I kind of called it a changing of the guard when you look at this more so, especially around the departure of Andy Constein, a player that's been at the club for 17 years. You know, J. Manuel Thomas came in with an ambition of 20 goals this season. He's still got 19 to go to get to that. <laughs> and, you know, if he wants to start by doing that on Saturday, that'll be, that'll go some way to easing any relegation fears that, that fans of Aberdeen may may currently have well I say relegation probably be a, a playoff place if that's where we end up but you know there's also been talk up here as well that Dylan McGee and Funzo Ojo won't be getting new contracts rumours going around that Dean Campbell Joe Lewis Connor McLennan have also been told that they're free to find new clubs you know these are players that are also uh, Dean Campbell aside that have been playing week in week out for Aberdeen yeah. so it goes back to my point about our players maybe losing that bit of motivation maybe demoralised because they know their future at the current club is coming to an end. And this for me is a fear because I thought it was a really spineless performance uh, in that game against Ross County last time out, a, a must win game and we only had two shots on target. Not good enough for me. And I think if the going gets tough uh, in the bottom six split fixtures, I've got question marks around whether the players can roll up their sleeves and, and get tough with it. It's that, it's that thing though, Obviously, all the all these deals have been made fairly public at Aberdeen. I think the Considine one was kind of leaked, to be fair. But normally, you know, players will know that they're going. But I think from a fan's perspective, if you then start seeing slumps in performances and these guys are playing games, it, it really does have an effect, doesn't it? Yeah, massively. I think the Considine one, the, I think it was, you know, not really helped by Jim Goodwin coming out a, a few weeks prior saying all that was left is dotting the I's and crossing the T's and two weeks later the, the contract's been pulled look the, the way that that situation's been handled is unprofessional from both sides I don't agree with however it got leaked from Consign whether it be agent or player um, it should never have made it out there but I also feel the club have been pretty poor in leaking you know wage information relating to the deal as well because it's then equally thrown the player under the bus so a really messy kind of situation around a player that didn't deserve the end to his Aberdeen career in that manner. As as we mentioned Aberdeen currently find themselves just six points above St Johnston who are sitting in 11th just now you, you've mentioned it already there's got to be a touch of nerves creeping in amongst the Aberdeen fans that you could be pulled into that relegation scrap I take it that's the case. Yeah, don't don't say it so smugly, knowing that you're possibly safe from that. that, I, that I, I, I still think we need a win, to be honest. Um, and I, I'm still worried. These first two games, we've got yourselves and then and then Hibs, probably the two most difficult games you could get for ourselves. And then we play St Johnston. If we if we were to lose those games back to back and St Johnston pick up a few points, I'm cacking myself <laughs> I, that, that's the thing you know even being you know with with Aberdeen probably having the best goal difference in the bottom six it does give me some crumb of comfort that you could argue we're maybe seven points and um, when you want to take goal difference into account but definitely not counting my chickens here but I suppose you guys will be delighted that it's actually a three o'clock on a Saturday game when you're venturing north and uh, Angus will need to worry about his four hour journey in the dark and cold <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still waiting on the game getting rearranged for December uh, yeah. to be honest and it being a Tuesday or Wednesday night I, I still fully expect that knowing the SPFL because that's that's the traditional kickoff time for us at Pataudry I'm just hoping there's no massive downpour and it affects a pitch a couple of hours before kickoff <laughs> still not and still not forgotten that one there, there will definitely be like gale force winds and snow <laughs> and stuff like that it, it wouldn't be right if we didn't go up there with some form of weather warning like, well, because <laughs> that's the typical typical trend when we go up to Pataudry these days. Well, I, ha I had a blizzard about half an hour before I got my bus on Saturday for the Ross County game. So, yeah, don't don't expect the unexpected, That that's for sure. But it'll be interesting because I think, you know, 
albeit you didn't get the the result that saw you guys into the top six against Motherwell, but you'll probably be buoyed by some of you know performances that you've put in this season. And I think Livingston will know there's a probably fragility around Aberdeen just now. And I think you might, in my opinion, deploy a kind of similar game plan to what Ross County did, sit in and frustrate Aberdeen and, and look to to pounce where when you get that chance and take them. Obviously, you know, kind of what we've said about going to the, you know, like Ibrox and Parkhead, you've then got to be clinical when the when the chances come round. But well, we know what Bruce Anderson can do this season and you've caused us plenty of problems, albeit more so at home and you probably want a game you want to forget is that last trip to Tawdry, but I'm sure there's some wrongs needing to be rewritten for when you come back up here. Yeah, and looking looking to the game itself, who who do Livy need to keep an eye out for? Who are the, the kind of form players at Aberdeen just now? That might be a, a short list for you to read out then, Glenn, but who are the players um, that we need to have a wee look out for when we go up? Well, it's a very short list. I'd put Ross McCrory in there, um, albeit strangely, Jim Goodwin subbed them off just past the hour mark on Saturday against Ross County. Uh, Ross McCrory has found himself moved into to midfield now that Colin Ramsey's back fit. Funzo Ojo did start a right back at the weekend, but you know Ross McCrory regained that place in him, along with Lewis Ferguson and Connor Barron have formed a really good midfield three. Connor Barron, probably Livingston fans don't know too much about, um, spent the 16 games on loan at Kelty Hearts at the start of this season and has fought his way into the first team uh, under Jim Goodwin and really been a revelation. He's kind of taken the, the game by the scruff of the neck, really good um, distribution and recycling the play. Um, I'm maybe getting a bit ahead of myself, but I've twice compared him to Billy Gilmore on the podcast. Um, so I'll leave you to to judge that one when you make the trip up to Pataudry. But there's just a lot to like about his tenacity in midfield and for a player so young and so small as well, the way he kind of has been dominating games recently. I'm really looking forward to see what he can offer, certainly going forward. Vicente Bizawin, I know a player, Livingston fans, maybe not got full memory of with his ridiculous play acting when we went to Pataudry. Again, that play acting came to the fore at Dundee. That that was ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, 100%. I never defended it on the podcast. Uh, it was extremely embarrassing. A player I haven't really rated. I think he has the odd flash in the pan, but for me, doesn't do enough across the 90 minutes, especially defensively. I feel he doesn't track back as much as Ryan Hedges has done. But the fact that I'm naming two centre midfielders as the players to watch out for, I think, tells you where Aberdeen are. Christian Ramirez has gone massively off the boil. Um, I don't know whether that's down to the fact that he's um, sulking over the fact that Stephen Glass has left. His family are actually heading back to America for the summer holidays this week. So he'll be without his family here. Um, his wife and kids go, go back to America. So I'm not sure if he'll be that'll be playing on his mind as well. He's not exactly looked like scoring in recent weeks. And obviously defensively, we've still not exactly looked sound, struggled in the set pieces against Dundee. Ross County didn't cause us too many problems from, from open play, but certainly the pace that Regan Charles Cook and Joseph Hungbo provided did look to exploit us. And again, we saw that in, in the last meeting at Allenville that, that you guys did did cause us problem when you got the ball down and, and ran at us. So, yeah, the fact that I'm saying two centre midfielders now, I, I wasn't even going to preview the game for red-tinted glasses until next week. I'm going to maybe even have to delay that even further. <laughs> well, now that you've mentioned Christian Ramirez is off the boil, I look forward to him scoring a double against us. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're talking about Bizarro, and I, I, I find that a miracle he's coping up at Pataudry because it can be quite windy up there. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> he must struggle to stay up on his feet at home games. But no, Glenn, obviously, thank you so much for, for coming back on the podcast to preview it. Before we before we finish up, though, what is your prediction for the game at Pitaudry? I mean, we're doing this two days after Aberdeen ended up in the bottom six. Right now, uh, I'm going to probably say what I did again for Saturday and just say 1 1. I just don't have the faith in Aberdeen just now that we look like a team that we're going to go out and win games. And I think last time I was saying that we did come out and smash the mid at home, albeit that was back in December. So that's how far back I'm going to the last decent performance I remember. But 
I just think Martindale, he's clever. Livingston will want to come up here. As I said, you know, didn't exactly cover yourselves in glory last time you guys came up here. And I think, I know, I think I've listened to a few of your shows and I think, you know, you probably have that up, up there as one of your worst performances yeah. of the season. And I just think Livingston have got the players that can cause Aberdeen problems, the likes of Bruce Anderson, who seems to just have a point to prove every time he comes up against us. Well, you, might, you might not have to come up against Bruce because Bruce is out injured just now. So it's Did he still injured? I wasn't sure. Yeah. I noticed he was a marked orange on fantasy football. So I was like, <laughs> maybe that's a 50-50. But again, the likes of Stefan Omionga, Jason Holt loves to play against Aberdeen with that uh, age-old Rangers connection. And then you've also got Alan Forrest, who seems to be trying to prove um, to anyone who wants to get him on a pre-contract as well, as much as you guys maybe don't want to hear that. So yeah. there's there's certainly players that I think Livingston will cause us loads of problems with, and I just just haven't seen enough from Aberdeen recently that, that I feel that we can cause Livingston problems. Well, Glenn, as I say, uh, it's great to have you back on the podcast Obviously, you do the Red Tinted podcast as well. Let our listeners know where they can find you if they want to, to listen in to your previews and the reaction to the games. Yeah, so it might be a very downbeat um, preview for the <laughs> Livingston game coming up, but uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Anchor, and we're also um, on YouTube as well. We're just 25 subscribers short of 800, so uh, if you want to hear any meltdowns, especially if the, the game against Livingston doesn't go to plan, um, and me pulling what little hair I have out left um, <laughs> over our relegation concerns, then um, head over to YouTube and check us out. Magic. Well, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again next season as well uh, to, <laughs> to, have some, to have some conversations about Aberdeen Livy games. I, I really hope so. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Thought Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in and week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback. Either leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. As Angus said, we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Search Thought Livy to find us and you'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one, on all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if none of those options suit you, though, all you have to do is head to our website, totlivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we've done over the last few years. And just before Angus wraps it up, we had quite a big milestone for our little podcast. We hit 30,000 downloads earlier in the week, which for our three daft days, even going back to Andy Sempo, a, a, a even bigger daft day, to think that we would even get 30 folk listening at one point, talking about Livingston Football Club, we could never imagine that, you know, 30,000 folk, individuals, at some point have taken the time to listen to us. So, honestly, massive, massive thanks to all our listeners or anyone who's maybe tuned in for the odd episode here or there. It, it really is appreciated. It, it makes it all very much worthwhile. So, thank you so much for that. Couldn't have put it any better. But, uh, yeah, that's it for this week. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in, as always. Let's hope for another great week following Lovian's finest football team. Yeah.
Livingstone, oh Livingstone, to the premature. 